Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers, and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arawa, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 361 of our pharmacotherapy series, which majors in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The first case reads, TNA, a 51-year-old white male smoker, presents with daily cough and mild dyspnea on exertion with strenuous activity. He has noticed that walking up two flights of steps bothers him, when previously it did not. He has had a slight amount of wheezing, but no chest pain. He has no known chronic medical problems. He has smoked 1.5 packs per day for 34 years and he continues to smoke that amount. His physical examination is unremarkable. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is suspected. So my question to you reads, what diagnostic test should be ordered? A clinical diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease should be considered in any patient presenting with persistent dyspnea, chronic cough, or sputum production with a history of exposure to risk factors such as cigarette smoking. Spirometry is the gold standard diagnostic test and should be considered to confirm the diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The main values gleaned from spirometry will include the forced vital capacity abbreviated as FVC, forced expiratory volume in one second abbreviated as FEV1, and the forced expiratory volume in one second to forced vital capacity ratio. A forced expiratory volume in one second to forced vital capacity ratio of less than 0.70 following a bronchodilator indicates obstruction to expiratory flow consistent with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The forced expiratory volume in one second can be used in conjunction with other clinical indicators to further determine disease severity. Office spirometry demonstrates a forced expiratory volume in one second to forced vital capacity ratio of 0.69 and an absolute forced expiratory volume in one second of 81% of predicted. TNA has a CAT score of 7 and has had one exacerbation in the past year, which was managed at home. Using Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease Criteria which chronic obstructive pulmonary disease risk group should TNA be assigned and what other diagnostic tests would be necessary before initiating therapy. Based on Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease abbreviated as GOLD guidelines, this patient has clinical features most consistent with Group A. A CXR study is often performed to exclude other respiratory diagnoses contributing to the patient's symptoms. However, the abnormal spirometry is sufficient to make the diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and to initiate therapy. In certain cases of diagnostic uncertainty or in patients with severe disease being considered for surgical intervention, 
such as lung volume reduction surgery, a complete set of pulmonary function tests, including the determination of lung volumes and DLCO, may be performed. Complete pulmonary function testing, however, is not necessary to make the diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. In patients with more severe symptoms or airflow obstruction, assessment of oxygen status by means of pulse oximetry or ABG may be necessary. Pulse oximetry should be used to assess stable patients if the forced expiratory volume in one second is less than 35% of predicted or with clinical signs suggestive of respiratory failure or right heart failure. ABGs are recommended if peripheral saturation is less than 92%. An alpha-1 antitrypsin level to rule out alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is generally reserved for patients with disease onset at a young age, less than 45 years of age, or in patients with a strong family history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. My next question to you reads, what therapeutic interventions should be recommended for TNA at this point? We will first look at smoking cessation. A comprehensive smoking cessation plan with therapy should be initiated for TNA because smoking cessation is the only intervention proven to decrease the decline in forced expiratory volume in one second associated with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Although pharmacologic interventions for smoking cessation are covered elsewhere in the text it should be noted that a personalized message may be beneficial for this patient. Indeed, discussion of spirometry results with the patient can provide an important opportunity to deliver a personalized message. It can be explained to TNA that he is beginning to develop definite irreversible abnormalities in his pulmonary function and, therefore, is a susceptible smoker. It is critical for him to stop smoking and thereby prevent continued deterioration in lung function. We will now briefly look at immunizations. In addition to smoking cessation, this patient's immunization status should be evaluated. According to the Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease Guidelines and in the absence of contraindications, TNA is a candidate for vaccination against influenza and pneumococcal pneumonia, even though he is in the early stages of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are at risk for increased morbidity and mortality if they develop either of these infectious complications. Individuals at greatest risk for significant morbidity and mortality from influenza and pneumonia are those with chronic disease, including lung disease. Optimally, the influenza vaccine should be administered during the fall before the end of October. This allows an adequate antibody response before the peak influenza season, which typically occurs within the first quarter of the year. Annual immunization is required to ensure adequate antibody protection against influenza virus and is effective in reducing morbidity and mortality from influenza. The pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, also called Pneumovax 23 or PPSV 23, is also recommended for patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The PPSV23 contains 23S pneumoniae serotypes and provides protection against S pneumoniae. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, abbreviated as ACIP, now recommends a one-time dose of the PCV13 in addition to the PPSV23 in patients, equal to or older than 65 years of age. These vaccines should be separated as indicated to ensure an optimal immune response. To manage TNA's symptoms, treatment with an as-needed bronchodilator may be reasonable to start. Bronchodilators are the primary pharmacologic therapy used in the management of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. 
Available bronchodilator therapies include short or long-acting beta-2 agonists, short or long-acting anticholinergics and methyl xanthines, theophylline. For initial treatment, the most common choice for TNA would be a short-acting, inhaled beta-2 agonist, e.g., albuterol, a short-acting inhaled anticholinergic, e.g., ipratropium, or a combination of these two agents. Either of these therapies has a relatively short onset of action and is effective in relieving symptoms. Let's now progress to the short-acting inhaled beta-2 agonists. Beta-2 agonists produce bronchodilation by relaxing bronchial smooth muscle through activation of cyclic adenosine monophosphate, CAMP. The inhalation route of delivery for bronchodilators is recommended over oral therapy based on safety and efficacy. The dose-response curve among all available bronchodilators is relatively flat and similar. No evidence suggests that one agent is superior to another. Albuterol is the most frequently used agent in this class. It is available as a metered dose inhaler or dry powder inhaler abbreviated as DPI 90 micrograms per inhalation. It is also available as a premixed solution for nebulization, e.g., adult dose 2.5 mg per 0.5 ml, as well as a concentrated solution 5 mg per ml, that is 0.5% that requires saline to be prescribed separately. The onset of action of short-acting beta-2 agonists, e.g., albuterol, or levalbuterol, is rapid, within 5 minutes, and generally reaches maximal effect in 15 to 30 minutes. The duration of action is approximately 4 hours. Although inhaled beta-2 agonists are usually well tolerated, some patients experience adverse effects, such as tremors, tachycardia, or nervousness, with even low dosages. Although concern has been expressed about the safety of short-acting, inhaled beta-2 agonists in patients with cardiac disease, a cohort study using the Saskatchewan Health Services database concluded that there was no increased risk for fatal or non-fatal myocardial infarction in patients using these agents. And now we will progress to short-acting anticholinergics. The parasympathetic, that is cholinergic, nervous system plays a primary role in the control of bronchomotor tone in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. By inhibiting cyclic guanosine monophosphate, abbreviated as CGMP, in the lung, aerosolized anticholinergic drugs are effective bronchodilators. The bronchodilation produced by anticholinergics in patients with stable chronic obstructive pulmonary disease has been shown to be non-inferior to that achieved by inhaled beta-2 agonists. Iprotropium bromide is the primary short-acting anticholinergic agent used in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It is marketed as both a metered dose inhaler, 17 micrograms, ipratropium per puff, and as a solution for nebulization, 0.5 milligrams ipratropium per 2.5 milliliters. Iprotropium has an average onset of effect within 15 minutes, with a maximal bronchodilator effect in 60 to 90 minutes, although some patients may experience more rapid symptom relief. The duration of action is approximately 6 hours. Although some reports suggest a quicker onset of action, patients should be advised that the relief of acute symptoms will be slower compared with an inhaled beta-2 agonist. A typical dose of ipratropium is two inhalations four times daily. Although well tolerated, some patients experience dry mouth, nausea, and blurred vision with use of ipratropium. The anticholinergic actions of ipratropium are localized predominantly in the lungs, with an apparent specificity of action in the larger airways. Because it has minimal effects on sputum viscosity, 
there is little problem with drying of airway secretions. In addition, iprotropium's structure as a quaternary amine increases its polarity, thereby minimizing absorption from the lung and systemic side effects. These structural properties also reduce penetration across the blood-brain barrier, reducing the incidence of confusion and other central nervous system CNS, side effects. Let's now discuss combination beta-2 agonists anticholinergics. Combination therapy with two different classes of bronchodilators is appealing because it may decrease the cumulative dose of individual agents, thereby decreasing the risk of side effects while maintaining the benefits of each medication. In addition, anticholinergics and beta agonists have different mechanisms of action, and combining the two classes may provide additional benefit. Indeed, it has been demonstrated that combination therapy results in significantly greater increases in forced expiratory volume in one second, compared with use of either albuterol or iprotropium alone. The Combavon Respimat contains both albuterol and iprotropium in a single inhaler. The Respimat is a novel propellant-free inhalation device that produces a slow-moving mist from mechanical energy produced by the release of a compressed spring. Umacladinium plus Villanterol, a noroelipta, and Teotropium plus Olidatorol, marketed as Styolto Respimat, are once daily products that combine a long-acting anticholinergic plus a long-acting beta-2 agonist in a single device. Glycopyrrolate is available in combination with Indicatorol, marketed as Utebron Neo Halla, and in combination with Formoterol, Bevispi Aerosphere, but both dosed twice daily. Each has been approved for the maintenance treatment of airflow obstruction in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom, and if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arawa, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 362.